While the whole world was watching the horrifying events unfolding on September 11, 2001 in New York, another much quieter crime took place in the luxurious California hotel room. All eyes were glued to television screens, so no one noticed how 52-year-old Larry McNabb, a prominent lawyer who had come to the equestrian competition with his wife and friends, disappeared without a trace. His relatives were so consumed by the events happening thousands of kilometers away from them that they didn't even recognize how Larry was slowly dying in agony from the poison spreading through his body. Larry McNabney was an outstanding individual. Perhaps it was due to his high-profile cases or the television commercials where he rode horses and wore a cowboy hat, earning him the nickname Marlboro. Regardless, everyone knew about Larry McNabney, and clients lined up to seek his counsel. The attorney lived in Reno, Nevada, but practiced in Las Vegas as well, amassing a fortune over the years. Of course, he had his own problems, including alcohol abuse, but if you didn't know about his addiction, it seemed like he had achieved everything a person could dream of, especially after his encounter with Elisa Redelsberger. Eliza grew up in an affluent family in Florida. She was a vivacious and adventurous child with a deep love for horses, always being the center of attention. Joining the cheerleading team secured her popularity in school, and her IQ score of 140 placed her at the top of her class. However, Eliza dreamed of adventures more than education, so after graduating from school, she headed to the bright lights of Las Vegas. With her charming appearance and gentle voice, it was impossible to resist her and she proved it once again on a hot July day in 1995 when she entered Larry McNabb's law firm. A smart, self-assured 29-year-old woman accustomed to men doing whatever she wanted, she declared to the wealthy 46-year-old lawyer that she wanted to become his office manager. Whether it was due to her assertiveness or her appearance, he hired her the same day. Larry, who was 17 years her senior, had been married four times. Six months after their meeting, Elisa turned 30. Every morning, the spouses would drive out of their mansion in a new Jaguar belonging to the young wife. They spent the entire day working together in the office. Evenings were spent in restaurants where Larry ordered only the finest wines. Friends rejoiced at Larry's good fortune and the presence of a young woman who adored him. It was a fairy tale that could only come true in Vegas. However, for Larry's two adult children, Elisa was no Cinderella. She turned out to be a wicked stepmother, driving a wedge between them and their father. Moreover, the family's close friends were puzzled by the mystery that surrounded Elisa. You would ask her where she went to school, and suddenly you'd find yourself talking about skiing. Something just wasn't right, they recalled. Not to mention that while claiming to be the daughter of a wealthy Cuban businessman, she knew only two phrases in Spanish. Nevertheless, Elisa had no time to worry about her husband's children or the family's friends. Shopping awaited her. The girl loved to spend money, and she also had a passion for one of the most expensive sports horseback riding, which she introduced to her husband. Larry became just as passionate about it as Elisa. Soon, the spouses acquired their own stable. Overall, the McNabness were the perfect pair. He earned a fortune as a lawyer, and she spent that fortune on designer clothes, jewelry, and jaguars. Then, unexpectedly, in December 1995, a financial audit revealed that $140,000 of clients' funds had gone missing from the trust account. Larry was forced to cover the loss with his own money, but that wasn't the worst part. He lost his license, which meant he could no longer practice law in the state of Nevada. Because of this, McNabani headed west to California. They settled into a beautiful home in the Sacramento area. From the second floor of their new mansion, they had a view of golf courses and vineyards. Larry was pleased that he could afford the finest local wines. To make a name for himself, Larry began advertising his law firm. In Vegas, people had gone crazy over his suit, which was reminiscent of the Marlboro Man. He believed the same style would catch on in the new city, and he was right. His commercials became a sensation among the local community. The phone rang incessantly. His practice quickly became as successful as his previous one, because McNabani was truly an excellent lawyer who knew his craft. The practice thrived, and Larry hired a student named Sarah Dutra as his secretary. Elisa and Sarah quickly became friends. They shared a common passion, shopping at the finest boutiques where they bought matching items. Soon, the two girls became inseparable. They both had an interest in horse racing and could often be found at the racetrack. And so, on September 10, 2001, McNabani invited Sarah to Los Angeles for another show. The girls spent the morning shopping and then went to cheer for Larry, who was personally participating in a horse race. 
They enthusiastically supported the man from the stands when suddenly he fell and couldn't get up. Elisa didn't let anyone approach him, and together with Sarah, they escorted Larry to the car. Many assumed that the lawyer was hiding some illness from the public because, up until then, the always active and athletic Larry looked as if he was on the verge of death. As it turned out, that was indeed the case. In Sacramento, no one knew what had happened to Larry because nobody could see him. Everyone found it odd, but Elisa claimed that he was too ill, and she was trying to protect him from any additional infections. Since Larry didn't have a partner who could take over the business, his wife handled everything. She didn't have the right to be a lawyer, but her sharp mind and experience in the firm allowed her to handle things quite well. In mid-September, she even had to hire another assistant, Ginger Miller, and in October, another employee appeared, this time a very special one. Her name was Haley Jordan, and she was Elisa's 17-year-old daughter from a previous marriage. Although Elisa always reluctantly talked about her past, her friends were shocked to find out that she had a daughter. Nevertheless, the girl quickly became part of the team. After several weeks passed without Larry showing up, his children tried to see him, but their stepmother simply didn't allow it. She claimed that their father had no desire to calm them down. They didn't like it, but there was little they could do. Then, about a month after the incident at the show, Elisa told her friends that Larry had gone away for good. He had moved to another country and filed for divorce. Friends found this very strange. Larry's children found it even more strange. They were convinced that Elisa was lying and hired a private detective, but their search was unsuccessful. At the same time, Elisa and her girls didn't stop having fun. They spent so much that even Ginger became concerned that things were getting out of control. Finally, in November 2001, Ginger couldn't take it anymore and reported Larry's disappearance to the police. However, the police couldn't do anything because his wife refused to confirm it. Then, after the new year in 2002, when Larry had been missing for several months, Elisa surprised everyone once again. She closed the law firm and disappeared. On February 5, 2002, employees of the San Juan Vineyard contacted the San Joaquin County Police. They were weeding the grape plantation when they noticed vultures circling something. Upon closer inspection, they found a human leg sticking out from beneath the ground. When the police and forensic experts arrived at the scene, they carefully unearthed the body of a man. It turned out to be Larry McNabani. The autopsy revealed disturbing details of the murder. The grave was new, but Larry had died several months earlier, and he had been killed with a lethal dose of horse tranquilizer. The unusual method of murder reminded one of Larry's friends of something interesting, so he called the police. Elisa had once inquired if it was possible to kill someone using this tranquilizer. Kill a horse? he asked. No, a person, she replied. The man had initially thought it was a joke, but now it didn't seem that way to him. The police didn't find it funny, either. After nearly five months of disinterest in the case, investigators finally became intrigued by Elisa McNabani. They were afraid that she had become a victim herself, as no one knew her whereabouts. However, the circumstances of her disappearance were quite intriguing. Friends of the family revealed that Elisa had adopted a new persona. She had drastically changed her hair color and lost weight. Significant weight loss can alter one's facial appearance. Along with the new hair color, it suggested that Elisa might have been preparing to flee. Determined to uncover everything they could about her, the officers ran her name through various databases. The results shocked them. They thought there must be some mistake. They checked her name again and got the same result. There was no driver's license, no social security number, no hint of a woman with that name. Elisa McNabani simply did not exist. Not giving up, the police obtained her marriage certificate from Reno, Nevada, and learned that Elisa's maiden name was Elizabeth Barash, and she had been serving time in a Florida prison. The woman in the prison photo, however, bore no resemblance whatsoever to the fugitive. So who was she, really? Finally, the police caught a break. Elizabeth Barash recognized Lauren Renee Sims Jordan when they showed her a photo. Elisa McNabani was, in fact, Lauren Renee Sims Jordan, and the women had met while incarcerated in Florida. A check of Lauren Sims' name yielded 113 pages of information on her police records. Her list of fraudulent schemes, scams, and thefts seemed endless. Over the course of her career as a con artist, she had assumed 38 different identities. Lauren had been married three times and had two children. Between 1989 and 1992, she had been in and out of prison frequently, seemingly unable to stay within the bounds of the law. 
For example, once released on parole, she violated the terms and attended a hockey game where she ran into her parole officer. At one point, while under house arrest, Lauren simply cut off her electronic ankle bracelet and, taking her eight-year-old daughter with her, fled to Nevada. When the police examined Larry McNabani's documents, particularly the reasons for the revocation of his attorney's license in Nevada, they discovered that it was indeed Lauren who had embezzled money from the trust account. On March 1st, 2002, an arrest warrant was issued for Lauren Sims, noting that she may have altered her appearance and was traveling with her daughter, Haley. A reward of $10,000 was offered for information about her whereabouts. Three weeks later, Lauren was apprehended in Florida. Now going by the alias Shane Ivoroni, Lauren had settled in the state with her daughter and resumed her schemes. It was actually one of her daughter's friends who turned her in for the reward. Interestingly, Lauren did not resist arrest at all. Perhaps she had grown tired of that life, and the thrill of her cons had been one of the driving elements behind her actions. While California prepared the extradition documents, Florida police diligently interrogated Lauren, but even under pressure, she didn't break. For two weeks, she stubbornly claimed no involvement in the murder. Then she shocked everyone by writing a three-page confession in which she detailed how she and Sarah had planned and carried out Larry McNabani's murder. Remarkably, in Larry's death, she blamed Larry himself, stating that he had been controlling and didn't allow her to freely spend his money. So, together with Sarah, they decided to get rid of his constant control. They began slowly poisoning Larry by gradually adding tranquilizer to his system. Elisa explained that on the morning before the equestrian competition, they spiked his coffee with tranquilizers. When he collapsed unconscious at the racetrack, they took him back to the hotel and administered even more of the drug. In reality, the women had been poisoning him for several days, and when everyone thought he had simply overindulged again, Larry was in agony and slowly dying. When the next day the women put the suffering Larry into a wheelchair and placed him in a car, he was still conscious but unable to escape. The women drove the car to Yosemite Park, scouting for the perfect spot to bury their victim. Sarah calmly began digging a grave, even though Larry was still alive. However, Lauren couldn't bury him alive, so they put the man back in the car and drove away. Sarah Dutra later confessed that on the way back he kept begging for water, and Lauren gave it to him. She also poisoned the water. Upon returning home, the women waited until Larry became unconscious, after which they placed him in the garage refrigerator and sealed it shut with duct tape. For the next four months, while Lauren, Sarah, and their friends lived off Larry's money, he lay in a garage refrigerator sealed with duct tape. Then, at the end of December 2001, when the money was running low, Lauren decided it was time to disappear. She buried Larry on a vineyard as a sign of respect for his love of wine. They gave the refrigerator to a friend of the family. Lauren gave a farewell gift to Sarah, buying her a red BMW, and she bought herself a red Jaguar. Then, on March 31st, 2002, just before her extradition, Lauren shocked everyone one last time. Determined to spare her children the ordeal of witnessing their mother's legal battle, she left life on her own terms. Lauren died as she had lived, maintaining control over herself. In her cell, she left a note for her lawyer asking him to sue the prison for not stopping her. She requested that the money she saved be given to her children. However, this endeavor was unsuccessful. Haley was not involved in the crime and returned to her grandparents. The trial of Sarah began in 2003, initially charging her with first-degree murder. She claimed that Lauren, whom she knew as Elisa, had threatened and manipulated her, forcing her to participate in the crime. However, Haley, who testified in court, stated that Sarah was never afraid of her mother. Lauren's confession, on the other hand, stated that Sarah's role was not secondary, and it was she who administered the lethal dose of tranquilizer to Larry. Still, some jurors partially believed Sarah and found her guilty of voluntary manslaughter. The judge sentenced her to 11 years in prison. Sarah served almost eight years and was released in 2011 at the age of 31. Indeed, it's an incredible story that truly makes us question how well we know the people around us. Larry McNabney, the brilliant lawyer, took pride in his courtroom prowess, and he meticulously studied every case he worked on. But when it came to his own wife, with whom he spent six years, he never realized that she was a con artist who had once simply cut off her electronic ankle monitor and fled to Las Vegas. Larry McNabney probably never even knew his wife's real name, 
let alone that she would become his murderer. Sacramento is the capital of the American state of California. In 1991, it was a dangerous place where hundreds of murders were reported each year. Investigating them was more challenging than today, but it was this difficult task that Detective John Cabrera dedicated his life to. He didn't yet know that he would soon face an investigation that would be followed with unprecedented interest across the country. On March 7th, he was called to a very quiet neighborhood, mainly inhabited by retirees. The victim was 58-year-old Philip Inhofer. Philip was a former military man who had been working at the McClellan Air Force Base as a civilian. His son, Henry Inhofer, called the police. Henry was called by his father's boss, informing him that his father hadn't shown up for work. As a former military man, Philip rarely ever showed up late, let alone failed to show up at all. Hence, Henry immediately went to find out what had happened. He discovered the body in a small storage room. It was a horrifying sight. Philip was naked and lying face down, covered in blood. His head was tightly wrapped in a white plastic bag. John and his team didn't need much time to understand that Philip wasn't killed in the storage room where his son found him. The shredded shower curtain and blood on the bathroom walls indicated that the attack began there. Philip was taking a shower when the attacker lunged at him with a knife. His glasses were lying on the sink, meaning he didn't even have time to put them on. The initial knife strikes didn't kill Philip, and numerous defensive wounds on his arms indicated that he fought for his life. He even managed to exit the bathroom and push the attacker into another room, but was eventually overpowered. The assailant inflicted 32 strikes on Philip with two knives, one of which broke and got lodged in the victim's chest. After that, the assailant grabbed something heavy and struck the man's head so hard that blood splattered onto the ceiling. Then he placed a bag over the victim's head, tied it, and moved Philip into the storage room. Whoever did this had to possess exceptional strength to overpower a sturdy man, a former military man at that, and then move his body. The murder occurred in a very quiet neighborhood, and John Cabrera was not mistaken in assuming that someone should have heard something. A neighbor living across the street from Philip recounted that on the 5th, he and his wife were at home. Suddenly, the usual quiet of the night was disturbed by loud, rhythmic thuds. He decided to investigate the source of the noise. The man stepped out of his house and headed toward the sound. The thuds were coming from Philip's house, but they quickly ceased, and the lights went out. The neighbor thought that Philip might have been exercising, and the sound could have been weights being dropped on the floor. But the detective realized the neighbor heard Philip's murder when the assailant was striking him on the head. Therefore, the crime took place late at night on the 5th, around midnight. However, the motive for the crime remained unclear. It was unlikely to be a robbery since none of the drawers in the house were pulled out, and all the valuable items were left untouched. A possible clue was provided by Henry. He noticed that his father's car was missing. It was a Mercedes, always parked under the carport at home, with an original license plate with the numbers 36. Could the car have been the motive for the crime? Another thing in the victim's house drew attention. There was a note on the bedside table in the bedroom with a phone number and the name Jade Kabading. Obviously, Jade played some role in the victim's life if Philip carefully kept her number. However, none of the man's relatives and friends had ever heard of her. Who could this mysterious woman be, whom he kept hidden from everyone? In this matter, there were far more questions than answers. Any investigator knows that how a person lived often gives a clue as to how they died. That's why John began to study the victim's personal life. There were no reasons to suspect the man's family. Henry didn't often see his father, while growing up because he was a military man, stationed in Korea, then Vietnam, then Thailand. But when Philip retired and moved to Sacramento, it allowed the men to develop their relationship. Philip lovingly cared for his son and granddaughter, spending a lot of time with them. He was a very gentle, kind, generous man, always ready to help. However, even though he led a quiet life, Philip Inhofer wasn't a recluse and enjoyed spending time with colleagues, attending square dancing. Then it wasn't enough for him, and he decided to add some vibrant colors to his life. He bought a red Mercedes, but he didn't stop there. For some reason, he was attracted to girls who worked in the escort industry. Henry learned about this when he found the corresponding brochure in his father's house. The police began to understand that the name on the bedside table might be related precisely to this aspect of the victim's life. John asked around the streets of the city, but no one knew anything about Jade Cabatting. While studying Philip's phone calls, John Cabrera noticed that one number had no relation to the victim. So he simply dialed that number and directly asked the man who answered what his phone was doing on the call list of the deceased person. 
Additionally, he inquired if the man knew Jade Kabating. The man indeed recalled a girl named Jade. He had given her a ride when her car got stuck during a storm. She used his phone to call someone in Sacramento to pick her up and retrieve her Mercedes. Jade also mentioned to him that she worked at Mustang Ranch. John realized that he had finally stumbled upon a trail of the mysterious stranger. The witness not only linked Jade to the missing Mercedes, but also provided John with a clue to where she worked. Mustang Ranch was a legal brothel in the USA. It was located in Nevada and was considered a highly popular yet controversial place. With a copy of the girl's driver's license and her photo, John was able to identify her real name. The acquaintance of Philip Inhofer turned out to be a 19-year-old Michelle Comiskey. Among thieves, there is no honor. The same can be said for the girls in the brothel. They were willing to tell the police everything they knew about Michelle and recalled all the rumors that surrounded her. John had doubts about how much he could trust them. Being the most popular girl at Mustang Ranch, Michelle or Jade earned more than anyone else, which could not help but stir envy. Nevertheless, he learned a lot of new information about Michelle. She grew up in Iowa. After her parents' divorce, the girl lived with her father and brother, but couldn't get along with them, so she moved to her mother. However, she couldn't fit in with her stepfather there either, so at the age of 14, she ran away from home and headed to Florida. While other girls her age were studying in school and living under the loving care of their parents, Michelle had to survive on the streets. But strangely, she quickly felt at home there. By the time she became almost an adult, her sexual allure and ability to use that power were phenomenal. She was a tall, athletic girl who was not only beautiful, but also friendly, intelligent, adaptable to any situation. She did not conform to the stereotype of night butterflies. Her excellent manners and tasteful dressing set her apart from her peers. Even other girls couldn't resist her charm, let alone men. Since then, sex and violence followed her. At 19, she managed to marry twice. Rumors among the girls at the Mustang Ranch were that she threw a radio into her first husband's bath to electrocute him, although the police found no evidence of this. Her second marriage was even more interesting but shorter. She married a young soldier in Hawaii. Out of the blue, the young man fell ill severely, catching the attention of his commander, who demanded an investigation into the strange illness. Army investigators found a witness who saw Michelle adding rat poison to the food she prepared for her husband, but they couldn't interrogate the likely black widow. Michelle fled. The army concluded that the young wife, seeking her husband's insurance payout, wanted to receive $30,000 from her husband's insurance. What's most surprising is that despite all that happened, her husband continued to claim that Michelle loved him and would never do such a thing to him. Anyway, it was precisely because of her work at the Mustang Ranch that Michelle met Philip Inhofer. She confessed to her friends that she liked Philip and that he could be her ticket to a normal life. She spent all her free time with him. They saw each other for about four months and in turn, the man increasingly fell under Michelle's charm. He bought her jewelry, clothes, and showered her with attention. For Michelle's sake, he even got rid of his beloved dog. At some point, he asked his son how much his Mercedes-Benz was worth. Henry didn't understand why his father decided to buy another car, simply because Michelle liked the Mercedes. He wanted to know how valuable the car was that she was so fixated on. So Michelle's past hinted at no prior crimes, but her former roommate became the key to the investigation. She revealed that on March 5th, the day of Philip's murder, she dropped Michelle off at the man's house in Sacramento. Additionally, the girl recalled how Michelle asked her to stop at a store, where she inquired with the clerk about the effects of rat poison on a person. As a result, establishing that Michelle was the last person to see Philip alive, John obtained a warrant for her arrest on March 25th. She lived 15 miles away from Sacramento, but when the police arrived, it turned out she had fled long ago. They and her friend vanished in the middle of the night, not even paying rent. John Cabrera knew that finding Michelle would not be easy, especially since she had a head start of a whole month. The detective contacted the FBI to put her on the national wanted list. At the same time, he obtained the address of the warehouse rented by Michelle. The detective hoped to find crucial evidence there, maybe even the murder weapon. Unfortunately, nothing significant was found, only numerous boxes that allowed the police to learn more about the fugitive's hobbies. She created amazing things from stained glass and was a fan of Batman comic books. 
The girl had amassed a whole collection of photos and posters about bats in general, and Batman in particular. Meanwhile, news of the 19-year-old beauty, wanted in connection with such a brutal murder, naturally caught the public's attention. But John understood that if he didn't come up with something, interest in her would soon fade. Years of work had taught the detective to interact effectively with the media. During an interview with a journalist, he realized how to keep the story afloat. She asked him to tell her about the suspect, and he confessed that he called her Batgirl. The journalist's eyes lit up. John realized that this was exactly what he needed. He explained to her that Michelle was a Batman enthusiast. So much so that she had tattoos of bats encircling her left arm and tattoos of bleeding bite marks on her neck. The journalist published an article about the fugitive known as Batgirl, and it spread like wildfire. Despite this, catching Michelle was not easy. Aware that the police were searching for a beautiful young woman, she always tried to stay in the company of others. At one point, she went to Los Angeles, where she was fortunate to join the team of a very famous boxer. In Vegas, there was a fight between Tyson and Ruddick, and being resourceful and sociable, Michelle easily mingled with the boxer's staff and even attended a party with them in Nevada. Then she headed to Phoenix, Arizona, where she danced in a strip club. In Phoenix, knowing that people were aware of the tattoo on her arm, she concealed it under another tattoo. She left the one on her neck because it was hidden under her hair. But every time another story about her appeared in the newspapers or on TV, she moved on, realizing she needed to keep moving. John's instincts hinted to him that she was heading to Florida, which he informed his colleagues about. She had always told her friends at Mustang Ranch that someday she would go to Miami. Apparently, she planned to reach Miami and then travel to some country in the Caribbean, perhaps the Bahamas, convinced she would never be found there. She was probably right, so finding her should be a top priority. More than a month passed, and despite the unwavering interest from the media and the public, John and his team were one step behind Batgirl until luck finally favored the police. On May 7th, Michelle and her friend, whom she met in Phoenix, pulled over in a rented van at a parking lot in Mississippi to have a snack. Unaware that the van's door was slightly ajar, revealing the Mercedes parked inside that gleamed in the light. However, a police officer sitting across the road noticed it. He approached intending to warn the driver but was drawn to the silver-colored Mercedes Benz parked inside the van without license plates. Michelle explained she was just transporting the car. She probably didn't know that every car has a VIN number. The officer checked the car's VIN number and, of course, discovered it was the vehicle involved in the brutal murder in Sacramento and was being sought. Both women were arrested. Michelle's new friend didn't even know her as Michelle. She knew her as Julie Nelson. She was quickly released. As for Michelle, John Cabrera had found the suspect and the car directly linking her to the death of Philip Inhofer. But without the murder weapon and forensic evidence, proving her involvement in the murder in court would be difficult. What was needed was a confession. Therefore, he flew to Mississippi as quickly as possible. He introduced himself to the girl, read her rights, and provided her with the opportunity to demand a lawyer, but she decided to answer his questions. Michelle said, I caused pain to the man I loved, and then began her story. On that day, March 5th, her friend dropped her off at Philip's place. She arrived with her things because she had decided to quit her job at the Mustang Ranch and move in with him. After a day of shopping, they came home and had a wonderful evening. Later, when Philip went to take a shower, she slipped into the bedroom to take banned substances. She had been addicted to them for a while, but this time, they unexpectedly affected her. She returned to the bathroom, but instead of Philip, there was a monster. A terrifying monster with snakes coming out of its neck. Suddenly, she heard a voice. Evil forces urged her to deal with the monster. Listening to the command, Michelle started attacking it with a knife. After breaking one knife, she took another and continued. Then she beat it with a baseball bat. But that didn't seem enough, so she tied a bag over its head to make sure it couldn't breathe. Then she moved Philip to the storeroom, tidied up, had dinner, loaded her things into the car, and left. She claimed that she was also compelled to take Philip's car by evil forces because of its distinctive license plate. So, as a defensive tactic, Michelle opted for temporary insanity. However, several aspects did not fit into this picture. Firstly, she didn't just flee from Philip's house and hide in his car. She had the presence of mind to clean up the crime scene and take away all the dirty towels, one of the knives, and the bat. Secondly, on her way to Philip's place, she inquired about the effects of rat poison. This means that she contemplated the crime for some time, 
and the attack wasn't spontaneous. Thirdly, she openly told everyone that she would take her Mercedes. It was precisely the Mercedes that led to Philip's demise. When he refused to gift her the car, she simply killed the man because she desired the vehicle so much. Michelle Kaminsky was charged with first-degree murder, but John's work was not yet finished. He had to gather as much evidence as possible for the trial. Upon inspecting Phillips' found Mercedes, he discovered blood stains inside and an aluminum bat. The stains were from the towels that the girl had disposed of while she decided to leave the bat. He also found something like a ledger containing data on hundreds of the girl's clients, including Philip's name. The evidence was piling up like a snowball, and it seemed that Batgirl's days were numbered. She faced the highest penalty. The judge reviewed all the evidence collected by John and his team and ruled that it was more than sufficient for a jury trial. Apparently, Michelle arrived at the same conclusion. Realizing that incontrovertible evidence had been gathered against her, she struck a deal. She received a sentence ranging from 26 years to life imprisonment and never appeared before a jury. Journalists repeatedly asked her for an interview, and she declined each time. However, on the third occasion, she responded in writing, admitting that she lives every day with the murder of Mr. Inhofer. Days pass, and she feels an increasing understanding and respect for his life, making her sorrow deepen. I took this man away from his family, friends, and everyday life. He deserved to live. Every time the parole commission's review date approaches, I bring pain again and again, making them relive this horror. I am no longer the young girl I used to be. Today, I hold myself fully accountable for my actions. It seemed like she was preparing for her parole commission hearing. It worked. After almost 30 years of imprisonment, Michelle Kaminsky emerged as a relatively young woman. She had just turned 50 and could enjoy the remaining years of her life. What she's doing now and whether she can adapt to life at 50 remains unknown. Since youth, she was accustomed to using her beauty, attracting men like a magnet, making each feel special. But at 20, finding herself in prison, she had to learn to approach life differently. Has this path been successful? One can only hope so. On April 14, 2023, two friends, 32-year-old Syraporn Khan Wong and 36-year-old Sararat Rangsaiwathaporn, commonly known as M, arrived at the Meklong River Bank in Ratchaburi, Thailand, to release fish into the river. This act of kindness, a virtuous deed, essentially constituted a traditional Buddhist ceremony. A surveillance camera captured Syraporn as she walked along the riverside pier, carrying the fish. She appeared lively and perfectly healthy. However, just moments later, Syraporn collapsed and passed away. Bystanders attempted to help her, but it was already too late. The sudden loss of her daughter during a routine outing with a friend shocked Syraporn's mother. She shared her suspicions with the police because her daughter had recently become friends with M. Furthermore, she was troubled by the disappearance of her daughter's belongings, an expensive handbag, around 40,000 baht in cash, a little over $1,000, and two mobile phones. The police initiated an investigation and attempted to gather details from M about the incident. Surprisingly, M claimed that she wasn't with her friend during the river incident. However, surveillance footage painted a different picture, when bystanders tried to save Syraporn's life, her friend fled in the opposite direction. Only after irrefutable evidence was presented, did M admit that she was at the river during the Buddhist ceremony. Forensic experts examined Syraporn's blood and stomach contents, confirming investigators and the deceased's family's suspicions by detecting traces of cyanide in her kidneys. M was arrested on April 25th, and during a search of her house, a bottle of cyanide was found. When news of Syraporn's suspicious death reached the media, several other families contacted the police, suddenly realizing that their loved ones had also died after last being seen in M's company. M was a graduate of Nakhon Patam Rajabat University, located slightly west of Bangkok. During her time there, she didn't stand out, and her professors cannot recall anything unusual about her appearance or behavior. She obtained her diploma in 2009 and became a specialist in the field of public relations. From 2012 to 2022, 
Over the course of 10 years, she worked as a representative for at least three leading insurance agencies in the Thai market. Investigators were relieved to find out that there were no insurance claims made for any of the 12 policies M had sold. M was married to a police officer named Witun Rangsai Wathaporn, with whom she lived until 2022. During this time, Witun rose to the rank of a lieutenant colonel, and the couple had two children. They lived in an apartment provided by the police force, where their neighbors were fellow police officers. Neighbors remember M as reserved and only interacting with well-off police families. In 2022, the couple separated, fairly amicably, as they continued to live together for some time afterward. However, by the end of 2022, M started seeing a 35-year-old man named Sutizak Poonkwan. The two were expecting a child, as M was four months pregnant. Unfortunately, on March 12, 2023, her boyfriend unexpectedly passed away, leading the police to now believe that he too fell victim to poisoning. After having dinner, Sutizak suddenly lost consciousness, at a gas station. He was taken to the hospital, discharged, but unfortunately passed away the next day. Later, it became known to investigators that M had called her ex-husband, who came to her from Bangkok to Udon Thani. The former spouses got into Sutizak's car and without much hesitation, they went to apply for a loan, using the car as collateral. After that, they attempted to visit people to whom Sutizak had lent money, and tried to collect all these debts. In reality, M wanted to gain much more after her boyfriend's death. A representative from the insurance company contacted the police and shared that M had wanted to insure the man's life for 7 million baht or $200,000, but the regular insurance premium would have been 1,000 baht or $28, and she decided against pursuing this idea. With each new piece of information about M, investigators grew more horrified. Fifteen friends, aged 33 to 45, who had previously never complained about their health, suddenly fell ill after spending time with M. Fourteen of them passed away shortly after being in her company. This group even included two police officers. Police Major Nipa Sanjan passed away on April 1, 2023, due to respiratory and cardiac failure. She collapsed immediately after going with M to pray at Prapatam Cherdi in Nakhon Patam. The police shared surveillance footage that captured the poisoning incident, and watching it is an emotional experience. Nipo was sitting on a bench when she suddenly became unwell. She curled up hit her head fell to the ground and lay motionless. What was her friend M doing at that moment? She was talking on the phone, with her hand resting on her side. At some point, she walked away from Nipa, completely ignoring her. She didn't even make an attempt to pretend to help. But was it worth expecting any semblance of care from her, considering she had already claimed 12 victims? Police Captain Kunda Torai didn't fare well after befriending M either. Kunda had just borrowed money from her friend before she was found lifeless in her car on August 10, 2022. There were no signs of trauma on her body. The car's dashcam, smartwatch, iPad, and mobile phone had all disappeared. The earliest murder linked to M dates back to 2015, involving the death of Montatip Kauin, known to everyone as Sai. M and Sai had been friends since childhood. While Sai wasn't exactly wealthy, she often lent various amounts of money to M. After marrying a foreigner, Sai moved to another country. However, in 2015, she returned to Thailand, and M picked her up from the airport in her car upon her arrival. Soon after, Sai passed away due to acute heart failure. Sai's mother remembers that M quickly intervened at the time, supposedly to handle her financial matters as per Sai's husband's request. Sai's family was shocked by her sudden death but believed it was fate. Yet, when news of M's accusations surfaced, they contacted the police, suspecting a connection, especially considering M had abruptly cut off all communication with Sai's family. As far as investigators know, after this incident, M refrained from committing crimes until 2020. However, from 2020 to 2023, 13 of her friends died. The symptoms they experienced were associated with cyanide poisoning. 
some of them passed away after lending money to the suspect, while others had valuable items go missing. Cantima Pazard, who lent a substantial sum of money to M, believes that she could have been the 15th victim of the serial poisoner known as M. Cyanide, as dubbed by journalists. Cantima had recently become friends with M. They went together to a large shopping center, but about a week before this, Cantima lent M 250,000 baht, approximately $7,000. While shopping, Cantima complained of a sore throat and feeling under the weather. While shopping, Cantima complained of a sore throat and feeling under the weather. M then gave her a cough medicine, likely of herbal origin. Cantima took the medicine, got into her car, and started driving home when she suddenly felt a heaviness in her chest. She attempted to call M, but M ignored her call. Fortunately, Cantima managed to reach the emergency medical hotline. By the time help arrived, she had stopped breathing, but medics were able to nearly bring her back to life. M never communicated with her again and didn't return the money. Now, of course, Cantima is certain that she could have become one of M's victims if help hadn't arrived in time. She reported her story to the police. M. Cyanide's motive confirms the conclusions of a criminological study that suggests the motive of female serial killers is often driven by the desire for enrichment or gain from people close to them. In contrast, for male serial killers, the motive is usually tied to satisfying their intimate needs and preying on victims. M. Cyanide was addicted to gambling and had a an desperate need to continue funding her addiction. She regularly visited gambling websites, and the police reported that somehow she lost nearly 1 million baht in a single day, which is approximately $28,000. Overall, the woman spent around 78 million baht on her addiction, over $2 million, which she obtained from her victims. Some of the money went toward paying off debts and obligations that M had accumulated due to her addiction, but not all of them were settled, and she continued to gamble with the rest. Law enforcement officers tried to identify the recipients of these funds and determine if any of these people were involved in the murders. While it's evident they weren't involved in the murders, the police are dismayed by the fact that online gambling websites continue to flourish in Thailand, generating significant profits for organized crime in the country and causing immense suffering for those who fall into their traps. The natural question arises, how did M convince her well-off acquaintances to give her money? After all, some of them had known her only recently, and it's unlikely that they would trust a new acquaintance so much. In reality, some people had known her since childhood, while others trusted her as a police officer's wife. Many of the victims were involved in financial schemes resembling pyramid schemes that M was part of. She would enter the lives of these affluent individuals, gaining their trust before various means of obtaining their money, including pyramid schemes, lottery fraud, shady investments, or simply borrowing money. Often, she would ask for small sums, and perhaps her well-off friends felt uncomfortable refusing her. Furthermore, in several cases, she managed to gain financial benefits even after poisoning her victims. For example, she assured the relatives of the deceased that she would handle all their affairs, gaining control. When victims inquired about getting their money back, she would invite them to lunch or on a trip and then introduce cyanide. Why didn't anyone notice that over a dozen acquaintances of M had died under suspicious circumstances? Because the poisoner operated in different provinces of the country, and until 2023, none of these cases were investigated. It's also important to note that the poisoner wasn't always in immediate proximity to the victims. For instance, Nimnakit, the wife of a doctor, passed away after ingesting a tablet sent to her by the poisoner via mail. The woman's husband believed his wife died due to constant fatigue and stress after giving birth to their little daughter. The poisoner had significant influence over Nim and dared to tell the young mother that she had gained weight during her pregnancy. She sent her a weight loss tablet. On November 23rd, just a month after giving birth, she sent another tablet, but it was dirty, and Nim couldn't take it. On the 25th of the same month, after taking the second tablet, Nim passed away. At that time, her husband wasn't at home, 
and her two children were left alone with their deceased mother until a neighbor came at the husband's request. Even though the woman's husband was a medical professional, he didn't suspect M and believe his wife had died of a heart condition they weren't aware of. A renowned forensic expert laments that Thailand lacks a coroner's office, which would be responsible for investigating sudden and suspicious deaths. In his opinion, if such a position existed, similar to those in the UK, Australia, and the US, M's crimes could have been uncovered sooner, and many lives could have been saved. M. Cyanide did not admit her guilt in the crimes, despite the efforts of the police. The lead investigator on the case explained that they only managed to get a partial admission from her regarding her involvement in the death of the latest victim, Cyaporn. She made a vague statement suggesting that cyanide had been mixed with illicit substances, which the victim ingested. However, the investigator doesn't believe this story. The reason is quite simple, who would mix cyanide with prohibited substances, especially considering that cyanide is an extremely dangerous poison, and any dosage of it is associated with an immediate risk of death. Due to M's lack of confession, investigators were eager to identify the exact source of the cyanide and understand how she managed to easily access it over such a long period from 2015 to 2023. The cyanide used by the poisoner was the Spanish brand Pan Riac, which is imported to Thailand by one of the 15 Thai companies. The lead investigator believed that someone helped M purchase the poison. It was revealed that her sister owns a pharmacy, but investigators were particularly interested in individuals who bought the substance with the same batch number as the one found in M's house. Among the 100 buyers, Thai actress Ice was identified. Possession of cyanide without permission is illegal in Thailand, and all buyers were summoned for questioning. Ice admitted to purchasing cyanide online on April 25th for 3,000 baht. She claimed she intended to use it against snakes and monitor lizards that posed a threat to her dogs and even provided a video as evidence. Ice's mother confirmed that the sealed bottle was still at their home and they would bring it to the police station for questioning. The police didn't press charges against Ice. Nevertheless, social media users criticized her, insinuating that she might become the next serial killer and referencing her manager's death three years ago, trying to link it to cyanide. This is likely more indicative of the current state of social media rather than any real suspicions about her. As for where M obtained the poison, the police haven't yet disclosed whether they've managed to uncover any information on that matter. After three months, the investigation into the horrific cases of cyanide poisonings came to an end. The chief investigator stated that the police had interviewed over 900 witnesses and examined 26,500 documents. He noted that this is a historic case for Thailand where the suspect planned serial killings over an eight-year period, poisoning victims with cyanide. The symptoms of cyanide poisoning, which medical professionals often mistake for natural health issues, such as stroke or heart attack, prevented doubts from arising in the minds of the victim's relatives. Her main goal was to obtain funds from the victims and eliminate the debts that burdened her. M. Cyanide has been charged with approximately 80 counts, an unprecedented number in Thailand's history. In addition to attempted murder and intentional homicide of 14 individuals, she is accused of food and drug adulteration, theft, and document forgery. Her former lawyer, Thanichir Ichwanawat, and her ex-husband have been charged with aiding and abetting. Her ex-husband was dismissed from his job and arrested after his connection to forged documents and possession of stolen property, particularly victims' jewelry, was discovered. Despite this, he was released on bail and placed under electronic monitoring due to the lack of direct evidence linking him to the murders. Additionally, some leniency was shown towards him after expressing a willingness to meet his ex-wife in prison and convince her to confess to the poisonings. If she confesses to the crimes, she might expect some leniency from the court, otherwise, she could face the death penalty. When news of the charges against M emerged in April 2023, some families of the victims demanded the death penalty for her. However, some legal experts suggested that her life would likely be spared even if she is found guilty. This is due to the Criminal Procedure Code, 
which was amended in 2007, preventing the execution of a pregnant defendant. Although the death penalty can be postponed for three years, the punishment will automatically be commuted to life imprisonment if her child is alive after three years. Unfortunately, it later became known that M had lost her child, making her ineligible for this provision of the law. The police emphasized that the maximum punishment she faces is the death penalty. Currently, she is held in a women's prison in Bangkok and reportedly enjoys popularity among the inmates. The government has announced impending changes to the regulations for purchasing cyanide in Thailand. Importers will be required to provide detailed information about all buyers, whether individuals, businesses, or factories. Providing the reason for the purchase will be mandatory. If importers fail to provide this information to the police every three months, their licenses will be revoked. If M is found guilty of the numerous poisonings, her name will be added to the list of serial killers in Thailand over the past 100 years. Up until this point, the list had only included male names. The roster of infamous murderers who struck fear into the country's residents includes Boon Peng Heap Lek, also known as Iron Chest Boon Peng, publicly beheaded in 1919 for not only taking victims' lives but also placing bodies in boxes and throwing them into a canal. He killed between two and seven people. Among recent criminals, some kid Pumpwang, known as Kid the Ripper, stands out. He was sentenced to life imprisonment for the murder of five masseuses in 2005. Chamlor Nert Songtuan allegedly poisoned at least eight truck drivers in 2011 to 2012 but died before being convicted. The list also features Si Ui, a convicted child killer who was executed in 1959, and the notorious adventurer Charles Sobrage, who managed to escape police custody in the 1970s after murdering 12 people. He earned nicknames like the Bikini Killer due to the attire of his victims and the Serpent for his skilled deception and ability to evade justice. He's the only one whose victim count compares to that of the one woman, who is likely to join this list, M. Cyanide. Larry Riskin joined the Navy after school and over the years of service, he achieved the rank of commanding officer in the Navy fleet. He participated in the Persian Gulf War and demonstrated courage and bravery multiple times, but unexpectedly discovered that he was taking orders from a fragile woman. Larry met Sonia Rios at a barbecue. She owned a beauty salon in the city of Lamita, a suburb of Los Angeles. He was immediately attracted to the very beautiful and striking woman, and within a year, Sonia took her husband's family name and became Sonia Riskin. They settled in Sonia's house. Larry was always extremely close to his family, parents, brothers, and especially his younger sister Sherry Jackson. But everything changed with the arrival of Sonia. She did not allow him to see his relatives, inventing various reasons why they couldn't visit them in Washington. The relationship deteriorated to the point that Larry didn't communicate with his sister and brothers for over 10 years. They only heard rumors that he had resigned and found a job as a teacher for children with special needs. His colleagues remember that he loved children and adored his job. However, he confessed that he was unhappy at home. One thing weighed heavily on him. He dreamed of becoming a father. However, Sonia did not want to have children, and being a very beautiful woman, she misled Larry, pretending to be younger than him. In reality, she was 16 years older. Of course, women at that age are still capable of having children. But Larry felt that his chances of fulfilling his dream were diminishing with each passing day. That's why he grasped at the last straw. In Sonia's homeland, the Philippines, he became attached to his wife's brother's grandchildren, Quincy and Jetmark. The parents of the teenagers believed that with Sonia and Larry in the USA, their children would have a better future, so they supported Larry's proposal to adopt them. Sonia did not object, but insisted on taking care of all the legal matters herself. A year passed, two, three, but the process of adoption was not progressing. 
Larry discovered that Sonia was intentionally sabotaging the adoption process. At that moment, it was his last chance to create a complete family, and he was very disappointed. So much so that he demanded a divorce. Sonia agreed, but with one condition. She asked her husband to go to the Philippines and sell her family business, a taxi company, a matter that needed to be resolved immediately. The man agreed, partly because he wanted to see the children, especially since Quincy's 16th birthday was approaching. Surprisingly, Sonia did not go, even though the matter concerned her family and her business. Before his visit to the Philippines, the first in 13 years, Larry visited his relatives in Washington. He was happy to start a new chapter in his life without his wife but with her nephews, whom he still hoped to adopt. Immediately after landing, Larry went to see them. During the birthday party, Larry noticed that the little cousin of the boys had developed an eye infection. He insisted on taking her to the hospital. Someone present made a call to Sonia, and informed her that they would be at the hospital. Larry put the girl in the car and, along with Jetmark and a few other adults, they all went to the hospital. After the visit to the doctor, they got back into the jeep and were about to return home when a motorcycle approached them. One of the two men on the motorcycle started shooting at Larry's head and abdomen. Then the criminals quickly fled the scene. Jetmark tried to help Larry, and called for help. He was confident that they would save him since the hospital was only a few steps away. But the boy was mistaken. They couldn't save Larry. He was 43 years old. When Sonia was informed of her husband's murder, she completely lost control. She was shaking all over and needed help from neighbors Nicole and Jim Thompson to calm her down. Nicole called Larry's sister, Sherry, to inform her about what had happened, but unexpectedly, Sherry started blaming Sonia for everything. Nicole and Jim didn't take her words seriously. Not then. However, the next morning, Sonia asked Jim again to come and help her search for documents. When Jim learned that Sonia was looking for her husband's insurance policy, he refused to help her. While Larry's family was preparing for his funeral, his wife was only interested in the insurance. Moreover, Sonia had no intention of attending the funeral. She arranged for her husband to be cremated, and the urn with his ashes remained in the Philippines with one of her relatives. Larry's relatives saw this as another blow from Sonia, but they still held the funeral and prepared a niche in the mausoleum, where they hoped to someday place the urn with his ashes. They hoped that the Philippine police would solve this case, confident that Larry's wife was behind it all. But at that time, they still didn't know, nor could they have known, that there was another mystery in this story, another man, and another murder. It was news that had the impact of a bomb exploding. Larry Riskin was not Sonia's first husband. And the reason why they were no longer together with her first husband was that he was killed in the Philippines 19 years ago. The man's name was Earl John Bordeaux. Earl's family lived in Davenport, Iowa, in the same house where he grew up. He was the pride of the family. Earl joined the Navy during the Vietnam War, but his unit was stationed in the Philippines, where he met an attractive local girl named Sonia, who sang at a nightclub near their base. It was obviously love at first sight because the young couple quickly got married, and a few months later, Earl brought his young wife home to meet his family. However, the happy reunion did not go well. The girl did not please Earl's family. Therefore, after his departure from the Navy, they settled in Southern California. Several years later, Sonia opened a beauty salon, and her husband found work in a bakery. Outwardly, it seemed like a family filled with love and harmony. But in reality, Sonia enjoyed giving orders to her military husband and controlled him as she pleased. They lived together for more than 20 years when Earl finally realized that such a family life and his wife's commands were burdening him, Sonia agreed to divorce. But before that, and here a strange sense of deja vu arose, the husband needed to go to the Philippines to sell the family taxi motor company. Earl didn't want to go, but his wife was inflexible on this issue, and the man chose not to argue. He pleaded with his younger brother Dennis to go with him, 
but he couldn't quickly obtain a passport, so Earl went to the Philippines alone. It was a hot August night when Earl's plane landed in Manila. He arrived at the house where his wife's relatives lived around midnight. The man was exhausted from the journey, fell onto the couch, and fell into a deep sleep, until he was truly killed. When the police arrived, they found Earl lying in a pool of his own blood. He had been shot. The officers concluded that a robber had entered the house, and Earl had interfered, but there were no signs of forced entry, nothing was stolen, and the criminal only fired at Earl. Three men were immediately arrested and charged with the murder. Later, two more were detained. They were all members of Sonia's family. Fresh human blood was found on the shirt and pants of one of Sonia's brothers. There was enough evidence to send the culprits to prison for a long time. But then came a surprise. Since Sonia was the closest relative, according to Philippine law, she was supposed to attend a preliminary hearing in court where charges would be brought against her family members. However, since she didn't show up, the charges were dropped, and the case was closed. The local authorities claimed their hands were tied. At least officially. Unofficially, the locals gossip that Sonia paid to make all the problems go away. As they explain it, a thousand dollars, and the witnesses would stay silent, and the evidence would disappear. Earl's brother, Dennis, felt guilty because he let his brother go alone, so he constantly called a lawyer in the Philippines, spending thousands of dollars on his own investigation, hoping to make Sonia worried. But instead, he became the target himself. He received around 200 threats over the phone, but he didn't calm down. He reported Sonia to the police and the FBI. As a result, he became the target of the killer. It happened once while he was fishing. The shooter missed, but it didn't end there. Later, the attack happened right near his garage. Dennis informed the FBI about everything, but nothing happened. The Bordeaux case was forgotten until, after 10 years, Dennis learned that Sonia had a second husband, and he suffered the same fate as his brother. Dennis hoped that the renewed interest in Sonia could also revive interest in his brother's case. Once earning Sonia's plans to obtain not only all the property but also her husband's insurance, things didn't go as planned. The insurance company hired a private investigator who quickly discovered that fraud was nothing new for Sonia. She had burned down her beauty salon for insurance purposes, manipulated taxes and receipts. She had been caught twice before, so her name was known to the police. The investigator provided his report to the employer, and the insurance company refused to pay Sonia the insurance money. However, the investigator's work impressed Sherry and her family so much that they hired him to investigate the murders. He quickly found out that Earl's and Larry's murders were similar in that the Sony brothers were involved in both crimes. They, like other family members, were financially dependent on Sonia and were willing to do anything she demanded. Sherry, just like Dennis, handed everything the private investigator found to the FBI, hoping that an investigation would finally begin. However, weeks and months passed, and nothing changed. Sonia continued working at her salon as usual. But after the new year, Sherry started receiving emails. The author claimed that Sonia was responsible for Larry's murder and offered to return his sister's ashes. The emails were signed by John Bordeaux. How could that be? Bordeaux was the surname of Sonia's first husband, but Earl John Bordeaux had long been dead. It turns out that Sonia had a son whose existence she kept secret. She gave birth to a boy in the Philippines when she was a very young girl, a teenager. Earl adopted the boy after their wedding. Earl's family knew nothing about him, nor did Larry's family, despite Larry's desperate desire to have children. Nevertheless, Sherry decided to respond to the emails, primarily because she wanted to return Larry's ashes. John asked for $35,000 in return. But the more they corresponded, the more Sherry became afraid of what kind of person he might be. What if he was a fraud or something worse? With each new letter, she realized that he was indeed worse. For an additional fee, he offered another service, to kill Sonia, 
whom Sherry despised. Sherry was frightened, not knowing how to escape this situation and fearing what else might happen. Her fears were not unfounded. On April 27, 2007, in Lamita, the 60-year-old owner of a beauty salon was found murdered. She had been shot, and the killing resembled an execution rather than a random shooting. The victim was Sonia Riskin, known as the Black Widow of Lamita, who was suspected of killing not one, but two husbands. She met the same fate as her victims. The arriving police were struck by the meticulous and well-kept nature of the house. It appeared that the owner rarely received visitors during her lifetime, which perfectly matched her character as a reclusive and suspicious woman. It was also interesting to note that there were no signs of forced entry. It seemed that the killer simply entered the house and shot his victim. Her purse remained untouched, along with the cash inside. The neighbors saw nothing. The victim's relatives immediately rushed to the scene, among them her beloved nephew, Eric de la Cruz. Sonia regarded him as her favorite grandson and was proud of him. The young man served on the USS Ronald Reagan aircraft carrier and had just returned home after a tour of Asia. Upon hearing that his beloved aunt had been killed, he immediately informed the police that if something happened to Sonia, John Bordeaux was responsible for it all. John Bordeaux didn't have to be searched for, as he was the one who found Sonia's body and contacted the rescue service. The detectives immediately found the relationship between the son and mother strange. There wasn't a single photograph of him in the house, no hint of a son, as if he didn't exist for Sonia. Overall, he seemed like the family outcast, especially compared to Sonia's favorite, Eric. John explained that although he and his mother sometimes couldn't find common ground and didn't communicate, the situation had improved recently, and he would never harm her. When asked who he believed could have committed the murder, he could only mention Sherry, Larry's sister. After all, she genuinely hated Sonia. As did Dennis. The FBI questioned both of them, but they had alibis. Moreover, no one was as devastated by Sonia's death as these two. They hoped Sonia would pay for her terrible actions by going to prison. So the detectives turned their attention back to John. The electronic emails signed with his name didn't work in his favor. Furthermore, he failed the polygraph test. Even his own relatives considered him the murderer. Allegedly, no one else had the motive, opportunity, and means to commit the crime, but he insisted on his innocence, and stood his ground. Therefore, the detectives didn't rush to arrest him, and they were rewarded with a clue from the Black Widow herself. A few days before Sonia's death, she contacted the police to report two strange incidents at her beauty salon. The first time, a young man appeared at her hairdressing salon, wanting a haircut. He called her from the parking lot, and Sonia saw him through the window. She became suspicious because he had a short, military-style haircut. It was clear he didn't need a haircut, so she told him that she only served regular clients, which he wasn't. It seemed like the incident was resolved, but two days later, the same guy returned to the salon and this time acted more aggressively. He opened fire on Sonia, causing her to panic and call the police. She informed the officers that she didn't know the shooter, but she remembered he had called her two days ago. The cautious woman recorded his number. It belonged to a certain Fernando Romero. Romero himself had disappeared, but the detectives only needed a warrant to access the history of his calls. They expected the phone to lead them to John Bordeaux, but no, his number wasn't listed. Instead, they found the number of someone they knew well. A person who had communicated with Fernando not once or twice, but frequently, especially in the hours before and after the murder. The number belonged to Sonia's beloved nephew, Eric de la Cruz. Further on, after a week, the news reached the FBI. Specialists were investigating the IP addresses, from which the supposed letters from John Bordeaux were sent. All of them led to Asia, Hong Kong, Korea. These addresses belonged to naval bases. The FBI employees knew that Eric and Romero were two sailors who served on an aircraft carrier. It was likely that they knew each other. 
Could these young individuals have planned the murder while being on an American military ship? The FBI investigated the location of the ship during the time the emails were sent. It was in ports in Hong Kong, Japan, and South Korea at the same time the letters were sent. However, sending letters is one thing, but why would Eric kill a woman who cared for him better than his own son? Sonia was killed late in the evening on Friday. And on Monday morning, even before the office opened, Eric was already waiting for her lawyer. He wanted to know how much money he would inherit from his beloved aunt. However, Sonia had another card hidden up her sleeve. Eric didn't receive a cent. All her money, homes, cars, absolutely all of Sonia's belongings were left to her son, Jean Bordeaux. But the young man had another harsh blow awaiting him. It turned out that all this time, while he believed he was the main suspect of the police, Jean Bordeaux was being misled. And when the investigators simply presented him with a photograph of Fernando Romero, Eric lost his ability to speak. Choking on surprise and stumbling over his words, he blurted out that he had conducted his own investigation, and Fernando had nothing to do with it. He must have realized that Fernando was the thread leading the investigation back to himself. Both young individuals were arrested and charged with the murder of Sonia Riskin. The police apologized to John for pressuring him. He was still frightened after what he had to endure, but he understood that the detectives were just doing their job. In February 2011, the trial began. Fernando and Eric were tried together. The prosecution faced a difficult task. The victim of the murder herself was suspected of orchestrating the killings of two husbands. The accused, the young sailors, could elicit sympathy in comparison. The prosecutor decided to be honest with the jury. He portrayed her as a cold-blooded killer deserving punishment, but now it was necessary to punish the defendants who not only killed a woman but also attempted to frame her son. It worked. The jury found the two guilty. They were sentenced to imprisonment ranging from 26 years to life. It was an astonishing family, they eliminated anyone in their path for financial gain. Sonia and her brothers killed Earl. Sonia and her brothers killed Larry. And Eric killed his beloved aunt. How many murders can there be in one family if it's not a Game of Thrones? The irony lies in the fact that Sonia killed two people who did nothing wrong and were always kind to her. Eric killed a person who had always been kind to him for the sake of money he never received. The Black Widow of Lameter truly reaped what she sowed. In 2019, Sherry went to the Philippines to personally try to find Larry's remains. She could only ascertain that the remains were passed from one relative to another under Eric's orders. In the end, her search led her to a house that had obviously been vacant for a long time. She couldn't fulfill her dream of returning with her brother's urn to their homeland. She was a master of tricks, never leaving behind any clues. A virtuoso in her craft, she was only successful because she lacked humanity. No one could have guessed that a smart but quiet girl would become one of the most sophisticated criminals in the world, responsible for a long list of adventures that financed her evolution from an ordinary girl into a dangerous figure leading a luxurious lifestyle, with a penchant for murder. The ruthless con artist was a true embodiment of evil, always staying one step ahead of the police, until finally, they had the chance to confront her face to face. On Thursday, July 19, 1990, residents of Florida, Steve and Jane McGowan, received a letter from their 34-year-old sister, Beverly. She bid them farewell and wrote that she was embarking on a journey to find herself in this world. Beverly added that she was quitting her job and selling her apartment because she intended to leave immediately. The contents of the letter deeply shocked the brother and sister. Beverly had worked hard and was satisfied with both her job and her new home. She had recently acquired the apartment she had dreamed of and worked two jobs to pay off the mortgage. Jane hurried to the police station to report her sister's disappearance, 
but the authorities could do little since the letters stated that Beverly had left of her own accord. The letters were written in Beverly's handwriting on notepad sheets found at her home. So Steve and Jane went home to Beverly in Pompano Beach to try and find answers to their questions. They immediately noticed that Beverly's red Volkswagen Fox was not in its usual parking spot. Beverly herself was not in the apartment, but it did not give the impression that she had packed up and left for good. There were dirty dishes in the sink, a nightshirt lay on the unmade bed, and clothes hung in the closet. However, there were also signs that Beverly had no intention of returning. The phone was disconnected, the answering machine was missing, and there was no sign of her two cats. Steve and Jane rummaged through drawers and discovered that Beverly's passport, birth certificate, and address book were also missing. Beverly worked in the loan department of a bank and had a part-time job at a non-profit organization. Steve contacted the bank to see if her colleagues could shed light on the situation. They informed him that the day before he received the farewell letter, Beverly had taken a sick day, citing illness. This was unusual considering Beverly's reputation as a responsible, and reliable employee. During the phone call, she also mentioned that she no longer wanted to live in her apartment and asked them to sell the mortgaged property and get rid of her personal belongings left in the apartment. Beverly was asked to send a telegram confirming her request, and such a telegram was indeed received. Although the circumstances were strange, Steve and Jane had to believe that their sister had truly left without explaining herself to anyone. However, Steve managed to convince the police to file a missing person report and he closed Beverly's credit cards. He reasoned that closing the cards would disrupt her travel plans and anger her enough to compel her to contact the family. On the same evening that Steve and Jane were inspecting their sister's apartment, a fisherman and his young niece went to search for bait for an upcoming fishing trip. They arrived at a wide irrigation canal located 160 kilometers north of Pompano Beach in a remote area of St. Lucie County. Leaving his niece in the car, the fisherman began walking along the canal when he noticed something that appeared to be a bag of trash. As he approached closer and realized what it was, he hurried back to the car and contacted the police. Deputies from the St. Lucie County Sheriff's Office, who arrived at the location indicated by the fisherman discovered the body of a woman. It was evident that the perpetrator not only took her life, but also made every effort to prevent her from being identified. However, he overlooked something. On the woman's right ankle, hidden beneath her jeans, there was a small tattoo of a yellow rose. The description of the tattoo was released to the media in the hopes that local residents could identify it. Steve McGowan had already returned home when the phone rang around 10 p.m. It was a friend of his missing sister. She had just heard the news about the discovery in the St. Lucie Canal and the matching tattoo that Beverly had. The next day, Steve and Jane went to St. Lucie to speak with investigators and show them a photograph of their sister's tattoo. Due to the condition of the body, traditional identification methods had to be ruled out, but both of them were confident that it was their Beverly. Dental records comparison confirmed that it was indeed her. The inspection of Beverly's apartment did not reveal any blood or suspicious items. There were no signs of a struggle. Steve and Jane couldn't understand who would harm their sister. She loved her family, especially her nephews, and they loved her. Beverly was not wealthy and was not involved in complicated relationships. Her life was overshadowed by the fact that her two boyfriends died in separate car accidents. However, despite her past, Steve was confident that Beverly had been quite content with her life recently. Although Beverly worked two jobs, it was not enough to cover her mortgage payments. To increase her income, she started renting out one of the bedrooms in her apartment. During the search of her apartment, investigators found a notebook with a list of potential tenants. Each entry included the full name, phone number, and the scheduled time for viewing the apartment. Except for one. The first line only had the name Alice, and was marked for Tuesday at 6.30. After meeting Alice, Beverly spoke highly of her. The woman had come from London, dressed impeccably, drove an impressive car, 
and worked for the renowned company IBM. Alice had moved to the region because she was temporarily transferred to the company's office in Fort Lauderdale. She had impressed Beverly to the point that she chose her as the new neighbor and informed her friend that Alice would be moving in on Friday, July 20. By the way, Beverly mentioned that Alice introduced her to numerology. Alice attempted to predict Beverly's future, but she needed various numbers that held significance in Beverly's life, such as her date of birth, passport number, social security number, and even details from her driver's license. Strangely enough, Beverly provided her with all of these numbers. Overall, she was satisfied with Alice's predictions about her future and shared them with her friends. Unfortunately, she did not share the last name of her new neighbor with them. Alice's identity remained a mystery. Additionally, there was no evidence to suggest that Alice had moved in or even visited Beverly's apartment. The investigators reached out to IBM, where they were informed that they had no employees from the UK working in the South Florida area. They didn't even have an office in Fort Lauderdale. The investigation into Beverly's finances revealed that on the day her body was found, someone withdrew $795 out of the $800 that was in her bank account. Her credit card was then used to purchase women's clothing and books at a shopping center in Miami. The salespeople who served the customer described her as a bright blonde with a British accent. The description matched that of a tall blonde woman who had attracted nationwide attention at the time. Eight years earlier, in 1992, police officer Lori Bembinick had been sentenced to life in prison for the murder of her ex-husband's former wife. The case had caused a sensation. Lori's glamorous appearance combined with the high-profile nature of the case made her somewhat of a celebrity. A few days before Beverly's murder, Lori had escaped from prison in Wisconsin. When the Miami salesperson was shown photographs of Lori Bembinick, they recognized her as the woman who had used Beverly's credit card. The police were puzzled as to how the convicted killer's path could have crossed with that of a modest bank employee until it was discovered that Laurie had actually fled to Canada, and was not in Florida at the time of the crime. However, on Friday July 20, one day after Beverly's body was discovered, her card was used again in Miami, this time at a travel agency. The cardholder had a notable appearance. It appeared to be a man dressed as a woman. The person wore a cheap, black wig in the style of Cleopatra, and oval-shaped glasses. The man spoke with a British accent, and introduced himself as Sam. Apparently, Sam was planning to fly to London in two days, on July 22, and used the card to purchase a ticket for British Airways Flight 292. Detectives examined the passenger registration records for Flight 292, as well as all other flights heading to Britain on July 22. Beverly McGowan's name was not on any of them. However, Beverly's car was found in the airport parking lot, where it had been parked for five days. Fingerprints found inside the car yielded no significant results, but four synthetic black wig hairs were discovered. British Airways Flight 292 arrived at Heathrow Airport on Monday, July 23, according to London time. After landing, a passenger with short black hair and oval glasses approached the Avis car rental counter. The passenger, presumably Sam, booked a car in Beverly McGowan's name and handed over her driver's license as proof. Beverly had shoulder-length dark hair and wore glasses. The person at the counter resembled her. The clerk asked for a credit card to pay for the car's fuel, and Sam handed over Beverly's Visa card, but the card was declined. Sam explained that they might have exceeded the limit, and paid in cash. In reality, by that time, Beverly's brother Steve had cancelled her credit cards. When Florida detectives learned about this unsuccessful transaction, Sam had long disappeared. Since the credit card was no longer active, its transactions could not be traced. Sam's arrival in Britain meant that he was beyond the jurisdiction of American law enforcement agencies. Florida detectives contacted the London police to request their assistance. Detective John Cornish agreed to help with the international investigation. 
he spoke with the Avis company and instructed their staff to direct the suspect to their nearest office if he contacted them. Later that same week, Sam did contact Avis. He requested an extension on the car rental, and he was asked to visit the nearby Avis office. The police waited for him at the location, but Sam never showed up. A backup plan was devised, where officers would wait at Heathrow Airport on the day of the car's return. That day arrived, but Sam once again failed to appear. In the early morning hours, Sam's abandoned car was found a few miles from the airport, devoid of any clues. Suspecting that Sam might be attempting to fly back to the United States, Detective Cornish ordered his team to board all flights heading to the US on that day to check the passengers, but this endeavor proved futile. The police missed the opportunity to apprehend the criminal. The only lead the police had left was British Airways Flight 292, since Sam didn't use Beverly's passport to board the flight, it meant he had booked a ticket under a different name. Investigators attempted to examine the 248 passengers on that flight, but by law, they were not allowed to check passengers who didn't reside in Florida. Therefore, they sought assistance from the U.S. State Department in Washington, D.C. Each passenger's name had to be compared with passport details, and since there was no unified database that consolidated all this information, the process could take years. It wasn't until January 1996 that the State Department provided the police with a name they deemed important. Sylvia and Hodgkinson, a British citizen, was on flight 292. The photo in her passport depicted a woman with dark hair and eyebrows. After her husband's death, she was forced to move into a women's shelter as she had nowhere else to go. Less than a year after her husband's death, a passport was issued in her name. Investigators suspected that someone else had impersonated Sylvia to obtain documents in her name. Since they couldn't locate Sylvia, in any way, there was concern that she had suffered a fate similar to Beverly's. The State Department also discovered an intriguing connection between Sylvia and two other women, Charlotte Ray Cowan, and Elaine Antoinette Parent. All three identities turned out to be inadvertently linked after an incident that occurred a year after Beverly's murder. On May 22, 1991, North Miami police approached a woman in a rented car. The car had been rented six months earlier in Los Angeles and was overdue for return. Stolen license plates were attached to the car to conceal its origin. Inside the car sat a tall, redhead woman who identified herself as Charlotte Ray Cowan and presented her documents to the officers. It was clear that Charlotte had been staying in the car with two dogs. Several wigs, the woman's personal diary, and a number of documents with Charlotte's photograph but different names, Sylvia Hodgkinson and Elaine Parent, were found in the car. The police arrested Charlotte based on her failure to return the rented car. She spent a night in jail and posted bail the next day. Remarkably, despite the woman's obvious use of false identities, the police took no action regarding this matter. On the day of Charlotte's court hearing for the offense, one of the arresting officers was present in the building. When it was time for Charlotte to appear before the court, a redhead woman stood up. However, the officer who had arrested Charlotte was shocked. The woman summoned to court by the subpoena, was not the same woman he had taken into custody. Charlotte herself couldn't understand why she had suddenly received a court summons. She asked the officer if the woman he had arrested was tall and a redhead. When he answered yes, she confidently stated that she knew exactly who it was. Nearly ten years earlier, in the mid-80s, Charlotte was relaxing at a bar in Orlando when an elegantly dressed woman with a British accent approached her. She had short red hair, like Charlotte, and amazing blue eyes. The woman introduced herself as an Trumont and offered to buy Charlotte a drink. Charlotte accepted the offer, and they engaged in casual conversation. During their chat, Anne casually brought up the topic of numerology. She mentioned that she would be happy to create a corresponding matrix for Charlotte and started by asking for her date of birth. One by one, Anne extracted Charlotte's social security number and driver's license details. 
She jotted everything down on a napkin and gave Charlotte a positive prediction about her future. Anne and Charlotte became instant friends and started communicating. A few days later, Charlotte met Anne's brother, a tall blonde man with the same elegant demeanor as his sister. However, over time, the women saw less of each other until they completely lost touch. So Charlotte was quite surprised when, several months later, and called her and said that her aunt had passed away, leaving her a significant inheritance. Anne was supposed to share the money with her brother but claimed that he had decided to have her institutionalized to claim all the money for himself. About a month after the phone call, Anne appeared on Charlotte's doorstep at 3 a.m. She had a moustache, wig, and a man's shirt with a tie. Sobbing, she explained that she had escaped from the institution where her brother had placed her. She was hiding from her family and needed help to disappear. And begged Charlotte to allow her to take her birth certificate so that she could create a new identity for herself. Initially, Charlotte refused, but she reluctantly agreed when she saw how distraught and was. Her friend promised to return the birth certificate soon. Weeks passed, and Charlotte heard nothing from Anne. She began to worry. Then, finally, she received a letter with the birth certificate and a note from Anne, apologizing for the delay. Charlotte didn't hear anything more about her friend until the moment she received a court summons in 1991. Hearing this fascinating story, the investigators became intrigued by the identity of the elusive and enigmatic fraudster, Elaine Parent. Like others, Parent was a real person, but little was known about her life. She was born in the Bronx, New York, on August 4, 1942. She was the only child of loving and fairly affluent parents. By the time she reached adulthood, she had transformed into a tall, slender beauty with dark hair and piercing blue eyes. At the age of 30, she moved to Florida and worked for a while at a real estate agency until her arrest in 1976 in Fort Lauderdale for shoplifting. Her fingerprints were taken and stored in the database. Then, in 1985, she stole jewelry worth $40,000 from an elderly acquaintance. This was around the same time Parent met Charlotte. Parent's fingerprints were compared to those of the woman arrested in 1991 for failing to return a rented car. They matched. The woman masquerading as Charlotte Coven, was Elaine Parent. Naturally, the conclusion was drawn that the new neighbor, Beverly McGowan Ellis, the elusive suspect Sam, and Elaine Parent were one and the same person. However, they still needed to directly link Elaine to Beverly's murder. The detectives reviewed the evidence in the case and examined a notebook containing letters Beverly had written to her brother and sister using an electrostatic detection device, ESDA. This specialized equipment is used to detect indentations or impressions on paper left by previously written letters. The analysis of the notebook revealed that it had been used for a series of other letters written not in Beverly's handwriting. It seemed the author was a woman who held a strong grudge against Beverly. The messages were rather aggressive and contained threats. The letters were compared to handwriting samples from Elaine Parent, and they matched. The letters written by Parent were addressed to a woman in London who held a high-ranking position as the CEO of a major company. For her safety in the case materials, she was referred to as Witness X. She shed light on many gaps in the life of the elusive fraudster. The woman revealed that she had met Elaine during a trip to Miami in the 1980s, and they quickly became friends. In 1985, when the police were searching for Elaine for the jewelry theft, she apparently fled to London and asked Witness X if she could stay with her. However, the two young women soon realized that they couldn't live together due to Elaine's explosive temperament and instability. In 1990, the con artist returned to the United States, but to witness X's surprise, she returned to London at the end of July. She was driving a car rented from Ives. Three months after her return to London, Parent stole two dogs belonging to her former friend and escaped to the United States. From there, she sent threatening letters to Witness X and attempted to extort a ransom for her dogs. 
these dogs were evidently the same ones found in her possession during her arrest in Miami in 1991. By the end of 1996, Parent faced charges of passport forgery from the State Department, but they had no idea where she could be hiding. In 1998, the television show America's Most Wanted aired an episode about Elaine Parent. When the show began, Patricia Nevins from St. Petersburg, Florida, was at home watching television. As soon as she saw Elaine's photo, she immediately recognized her. Patricia Nevins was a church worker and knew Elaine as a blonde named Sandra Little. Patricia met Sandra Little in 1992 when she was living in a homeless shelter in St. Petersburg. Patricia allowed Sandra to stay in her vacant bedroom, and she remained with her for almost 1.5 years. During this period, Sandra filed a lawsuit against a restaurant where she slipped and injured herself. She won the case and received compensation, the amount of which is undisclosed. Patricia described several curious incidents that occurred while she lived with Elaine. Elaine once told her that one way for her to lead a dignified life was to assume a different identity. Then, during a dinner party, parent mimed cutting a guest's hand to steal a gold bracelet. Patricia arranged for Elaine to speak with a psychiatrist, who later informed Patricia that Elaine was an extremely intelligent sociopath, who would leave Patricia's life as quickly as she entered it. This prediction came true when the women went their separate ways in 1993. After the police publicly appealed to the community to help capture Elaine, an intriguing letter was delivered to the office of the St. Lucie County Sheriff. Inside was a copy of a painting done in oil colors. It depicted Elaine Parent wearing a teal green swimsuit and pearl earrings. Her hair was gray and styled in the same manner Parent often chose. She was portrayed coming out of a pool. On the back, it was printed, Best Wishes, Your Chameleon. Psychiatrist Barbara Kavan, who had been assisting the police in the case, stated that Parent both desperately needed, and feared police attention. The painting is very telling. She sent it to the police to taunt them, as if to say, I'm alive, I'm okay, look for me, but you'll never find me. In February 1999, Elaine was featured in the documentary series World's Most Wanted, which brought her international attention. Reports poured in from around the world claiming to have seen parent in Turkey, France, Australia, and South Africa. The press dubbed her the most wanted woman in the world. In April 2002, America's Most Wanted aired another episode about Elaine Parent. Following the program, numerous calls came in from the affluent neighborhood of Panama City, Florida, claiming that a woman living there was Elaine. Three police officers were dispatched to the address. They arrived at a modest single-story house and knocked on the door. A middle-aged brunette woman, dressed in a beige silk pajama set, answered the door. The officers explained why they had come to see her. The woman introduced herself as Darlene Thompson and presented them with her military ID, which featured her photograph. She did not resemble the photograph of Elaine Parent that the officers had seen. Realizing that the neighbors had made a mistake, the officers nevertheless asked her to accompany them to the station for formalities. Darlene agreed and requested that the officers wait while she changed clothes. While the officers waited outside the bedroom, one of them examined Darlene's ID. Being a former military personnel, he immediately noticed a crucial missing stamp that confirmed the document's authenticity. The officer knocked on the bedroom door to clarify this matter, to which she responded that she was getting dressed. The officers waited for her to come out, but she never appeared. A gunshot rang out, and the officers rushed into the bedroom only to find Darlene dead. Subsequent fingerprint analysis officially confirmed that Darlene and Elaine Parent were the same person. It turned out that the house where Elaine lived belonged to another woman. Elaine had been renting a room from her since August 2001. The homeowner described her as a pleasant woman with a passion for cooking. During the search of the house, Elaine's Florida driver's license was found, featuring her photo but under the name of the woman she was staying with. In a notebook, 
She had written down information about a man from the neighboring town of Lynn Haven, including his social security number and credit cards. Elaine's closet was filled with wigs and both women's and men's clothing. A book on learning the French language and another on theatrical makeup were also discovered. Some acquaintances of Elaine mentioned that she often worked on a laptop, but it was never found. The diary she had with her when she was arrested over 10 years ago as Charlotte Cavan was also missing. Another intriguing detail to the portrait emerged, the police found a flyer with a photograph of Elaine and the name Antonia Racermen. The flyer stated that she was being sought by the FBI for the murder of a government official at a hotel in Washington. Interestingly, it appeared that Elaine had created the flyer herself, and the local police chief later speculated that she had made it to intimidate someone. The death of Elaine left many unanswered questions. The police believe she had up to 20 different identities that she used across the world, including the USA, UK, Turkey, Israel, France, and South Africa. Some suspect that she may have committed more murders, but no additional victims have been found. Three years prior to her death, investigator Norma Pfeiffer told the media, the brutality of the Maguire murder makes me think that someone capable of this has either done it before or will do it again. Opinions are divided as to whether she worked alone or had an accomplice. Some argued that she couldn't have managed Beverly on her own. And let's not forget about the attractive blonde man she presented as her brother. Psychologist Barbara Kerwin described Elaine as a virtuoso in her field, capable of effortlessly reading people's souls and uncovering their vulnerable spots. However, the motive behind her crimes remains completely unclear. Why would someone with Elaine's high intellect choose to engage in criminal activities instead of achieving great heights in any other field, especially considering that her crimes brought her more infamy than wealth? But Kerwin believes she knows the reason behind Elaine's schemes. She was driven by her own psychological demons, Barbara stated. I believe she impulsively stole the identities of others to fill her own emptiness.